Welcome to the Reimagine Podcast. Each week, give yourself 30 minutes and meet the people working hard to create the future of insurance today. Hi, this is Paul Tyler, and welcome to another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. Laura, how are you? I'm doing well today, Paul. It's great to be back, and we have a familiar guest with us. Yeah, yeah, we do. I was uh, <laughs> I was actually out, James, in Park City this weekend, and there was snow everywhere, snow everywhere. And I thought it was very apropos coming into this podcast. That's a good word, apropos. Laura, yeah, what do you think? I like that um, word. To talk about a chill in the, the weather, right? Oh, the literal the good and proverbial chill. That's, mm-hmm. the, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Laura, Laura yeah. why don't you give James a, the intro he deserves, and, and we want to uh, dig into your book. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure that anyone but James can give himself the intro he deserves, but we have back with us today James Benham. He's co-founder and CEO of JB Knowledge, TerraClaim, and Smart Compliance. But really why we're having him on today is he is the freshly minted author of Be Your Own VC, so 10 Bootstrapping Principles to Generate Cash and keep control. And we're excited, James, to have you back on, not only to catch up with you, but to learn more about the book and some of those principles. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. It's great to see y'all. It is it is cold everywhere, but it's also cold in the markets. So there's a lot to talk about in general around uh, chilling private equity, public equity, and uh, you know this renewed focus on this a mystical creature called profitability. <laughs> and uh, in the insurance markets too, right? I mean, this is this is a big deal. So it's a it's a timely topic, and uh, it is boot it is it is uh, the the uh, be your own VC book drop day. So thank you for having me on the actual day of the book drop. It just hit Amazon this morning. So thank you uh, for having me on. Hey, hey, well, first of all, congratulations, and uh, timing couldn't have been more perfect. I'm glad James, you wrote that in like a couple of days and published it right. <laughs> It was awesome. Amazing what tech does. So two, tell, and tell year, <laughs> two and a half year overnight success. Uh, it, it's like when people you know, talk about like the, how, how quick success has been in business or something. I'm like, yeah, 21 year overnight success. Like, like this been, I've, been working on, I've been working on this for 21 years, man. <laughs> like what you, The book, two and a half. So uh, it just actually worked out that I I hit COVID and, and hit a snag in my my project plan for, for the book writing. And uh, it uh, turned out to be a very good fortune of timing. Yeah, well, tell okay for for those of you, okay, we, we actually do have another episode that was great where you gave your backstory. However, we do get new guests, and uh, uh, you're not sort of the accidental bootstrapper. Do you want to give us a little bit of backstory? I don't know if it starts with your Teflon story, which I thought was great in this book, uh, or where, but you know, kind of, can you give people sort of a a little bit of the background sure. that would sort of says, yeah, this guy actually not only. He walks the talk. Yeah, I try to. I try to. I, you know, it's uh, so I'm uh, I'm 43. I'm from College Station, Texas. Was born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, whole family of entrepreneurs. My dad owned a Teflon company. My my his sisters and his brother all owned their own businesses. Uh, you know, it was I, I was I was surrounded by it, but everybody had bootstrapped. No one had gone and raised money. You know, they had. They had used a, a few thousand bucks of their own money to get things started. My dad's first business was on the floor of the living room when my sisters were born. And, you know, with a new kid came a new business almost. He had he had three kids and, and really three companies um, around the same time. And so I grew up in that, but he would never let me work for him. Um, he said I had to go figure it out on my own. And so when I was 12, I wanted to make some money because I've always been, you know, very, very, very uh, goal oriented would be an understatement. Um and so I started a lawn business and had a nice little racket in the neighborhood, cutting everybody's grass and making money doing that. And then when I was 16, started a computer consulting business back in the mid nineties, when it was hard to get on the internet. If you remember those days, it was actually challenging to configure your computer, made great money uh, doing that. And then when I came to college, I thought I would hang all that up and go work for, you know, at the time, a big five accounting firm. Now they're the big four. And I did two internships with with a great firm, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and just couldn't see myself working there. And so I went to my dad and said, "Hey, I know you said I could never work for you, but can uh, <laughs> can you can you give me a few thousand bucks to get this started?" And uh, that's that was that kind of the 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 impetus of what I, what I'm still doing today. Twenty one years later, we've got about two hundred and seventy employees now. We've 
we've built uh, the three companies we have now, Terra, Smart Compliance, and, and JB Knowledge. And then we have a, a fourth, Smart Bid, that we built and sold from 2008, uh, 2006 to 2018. Those 12 years, we built and sold a SaaS company. And so it's been a, a really fun run. Uh, we, we did it all off that few thousand dollars, uh, which is just hard hard to believe when you see the the seed, the, the pre-seed joke. I just laugh every time I see the word pre-seed. It's like pre-boarding. How do you board before you board? How do you seed round before a seed round? But pre-seed rounds that are, you know, are a million on an eight mil valuation. I'm like, that is an incredible sum of money um, to build something with. And so that's really... The, the story is that we, we figured out how to bootstrap this and use our own, you know, generate cash and use that cash to build product and then use that product to change companies and industries. It's been a, a really fun ride and I've got the world's best teammates to, to go along on it with. We build insurance software, which is how we got connected. <laughs> so, <laughs> by the way, the insurance connection is that we work for carriers, brokers and TPAs and that's uh, that's what we do. Still, still doing it. We've got a few offices around the world and 270 teammates, and we go to work every day on policy and claims. Pretty much every day, working on something around the policy and claims problem. It's still not solved, by the way. In case you didn't know, the problem is still not solved. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I have to ask a question because I think there's going to be some listeners out there wondering. You know, you mentioned starting off of a few thousand dollars, um, you know, years ago. How many thousands of dollars do you think it would take today to start? Is the dollar worth the same same amount, or are we are we talking more? Yeah, so all in, I think after you know the uh, some some line of credit and loans, it was probably about sixty eight grand. And you know, if you inflation adjust that, maybe you're at one hundred and fifty or two hundred. I don't know. I, I don't have time to run the math right now, but you know, I I think uh, that that there are going to be thousands of wonderful bootstrap companies started in the next two years and they will do it off of less money than you can possibly imagine you know at at its heart bootstrapping is about doing what you have to do so you can build what you want to build and and so if you can figure out any way to generate cash uh and then consume that cash to build a business rather than take it out in distributions for your own personal spending uh then then you can do it on almost any amount of money and uh, you could do it. I, th- I still think you could do it on a few thousand bucks if you started with a profit generating service activity and then were willing to suffer through the pain of not taking that money out of the business, living on as little as possible and then and building a real company. But I will say this, Laura, it's the slow, painful way of doing business building. It is really slow and really painful. Uh, you look at like, you know, MailChimp, which was bootstrapped and sold for billions of dollars. Um, that was a 21 year path. <laughs> so it's it's very it's a very different timeline for doing this. So could you could you build and grow and exit in five to seven years like most VC backed uh, companies are, are mandated to do? Probably not because it just takes a, a good bit longer. It's hell, in my opinion, it's a hell of a lot more fun. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to get you to get you the uh, give us the contrary opinion. So you have some great stats in your book. So what, what a half a million companies are started will be started this year, right? I think uh, James, what you use, and you said five on perc- average on average five percent of them get outside funding. Yep. So if you look at that five percent, so that's still a big number. Like yep. if I did my math right, twenty five thousand, I think uh, would be getting outside funding. How many of those? absolutely positively should have gotten the outside funding. Maybe it's not a number. Maybe it's a description of like, what's the circumstance when, you know what, they, they should not have bootstrapped this thing. Sure. And, and look, some companies do literally do require fundraising. So I don't, I don't want to negate that. And in the book, I talk about that a good bit. Like there's not, it's, it's not necessarily a, a an either or you can even do a, a seed round and then bootstrap the rest of the way, which, which is, which is great too. Or you can go take a, a, a SBA loan that doesn't have personal recourse. The whole point of SBA loans is to is to get entrepreneurs money, and they don't have to lose their house for it. Right? That's the entire point of those kind of loans. So there, there's a there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, I I think that you'll see those numbers tip in the next two years to higher percentages of people who have to who have to bootstrap because funding will become more and more scarce. Um, you know, it's it's just it's going it's going to happen. 
but there are some ideas that require outside funding. Most don't if you're willing to adjust your timetable. And I think that's like the the fundamental premise. There's a lot of folks who say, well, this I, opportunity is time limited in itself. If we don't take advantage of it right now, we're going to miss the window. That's like the number one thing you hear when people are raising money. And I sit in a lot of those pitches because I actually, believe it or not, am an investor as well. And so I do invest. I just prefer bootstrapping. And what I really like to do is invest in companies that raise the seed round and then bootstrap the rest of the way. That's my, my favorite, favorite thing to do. And they, and they say the same thing. Well, we need to raise money because if we don't raise money to bootstrap it, we would miss the opportunity window. The reality is you're probably not going to. The window is always a lot bigger, longer, and wider than you think it is. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to make money, and there's a lot of ways to innovate and to, and to, drive, to drive change. And, and change takes way longer than most people are willing to admit. I mean, look at just in the insurance space at the number of direct-to-consumer plays in the last seven years that said they were going to completely disrupt insurance. They were going to put brokers out of business. They were going, you know, A, you know, A B, C, D, E. And the reality is that most of them build technology for brokers now. Right, like they become tool builders for the existing channel because they found out how ex- how expensive distribution is, and so you, you're going to have to pivot and work in the existing industry. And that that the opportunity that they said was super time limited ended up not being super time limited, um, you know. And, and often their your initial premise is wrong to begin with. Anyway, you have to pivot, which is what you saw happen and, and what you're seeing happen. You're going to see that accelerate. By the way, the rate of the rate of business failures is about to accelerate to an un- uncomfortable level um, that you're not used to seeing because the rounds are going to get so much harder to raise that people will start going out of business. And so that's the the other thing. When you're, when you're seeing like a typical VC, they'll say two of their companies are going to just exit with wild success. You know, five or, or six will be in the middle and return capital and another two or three will, will actually fail and lose capital. And that's their, that's kind of their diamond shaped um, investment mantra that the ones that return capital plus the ones that have wild exits far dwarf the two or three losses. But you're going to see that that shift a little bit and that loss window widen up. So it'll, it'll be an interesting couple of years. You talked about pivoting and, you know, one of one of your principles, I like this one. It's talking about being willing to rewrite your rules, but not your values. So talk to us a little bit more about that and uh, what you think may happen to people's rules and values as we see, you know, failures kind of ballooning, if you will. Sure. And I think when you're when you're innovating and changing, you, you've you got to you've got to understand what's a rule and what's a value. Um, Jim Collins did a great job writing about values, and he said the difference between great companies and sustainably great companies that were sustainably great over a multi-decade period was that the sustainably great ones had values and stuck to them. And we we definitely experienced this the 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 hard way uh, in our business, but but Sebastian and I uh, and my dad, the the three of us that really got this thing started, we had a really hardcore set of values, um, you know, and, and we we finally encapsulated them into six of them that are, that are in the book. You know, do the right thing even when no one's looking. Be self motivated and resourceful. Show respect to everyone. Be an ambassador twenty four seven. Have each other's backs. Um, you know, think lean and, and enjoy the ride and geek out, right? Those, and I memorized them, my team memorized them. And, we, and that's the, that, that, those values drive us in who we hire and how we evaluate people and who we are, like what we want to do. And, and so when we look at opportunities for investment and opportunities to change things, and, you know, we run across some, some interesting stuff in insurance where, you know, hey, we're doing claims and policy management, we're doing some carrier data extracts, and there's this, this tangent over here in managed care, which by the way, you could spend an entire career just in managed care and, and only managed care and just do managed care and work comp. You could just do that your whole career. And we're like, well, if we do that, we're going to violate this value because, you know, and so we think about that a lot. Values drive you. Rules have to change. So I originally had a rule that we were going to do everything in the United States. I was going to have, you know, Texas and Louisiana labor, and we were going to service those markets. And then 9-11 happened. And one of my co-founders, couldn't get a visa renewed because because they pulled everybody's work visas and he was from Argentina. And so then we opened an office in Argentina because we had no other choice and we had to continue operating. And then we went down there when I was 22, 20, I just turned 23, went down to Argentina for the very first time, opened an office that I'd never been to, met eight new employees. We had no money and they had to bring in their own computers to work. And then we just 
rolled with it. And then I found out like like three quarters of my rules from the United States didn't even work in Argentina. Like I, I couldn't even have a sign on the door down there because this you know the the sign would make us a target for petty theft in Latin America. And then I you know the, all this other stuff that we couldn't do. I mean we it was a it was a weird time. I had to learn a new set of rules. It was you know the employer employee relationship in the United States was very casual at the time. In Argentina, it was very formal. You didn't hang out with your employee. You didn't go socialize with them. In the U.S., it was the opposite. So I had to change the. I had to change a lot of things around that, and and rewrite the rules. I thought I had, <laughs> but at the but those six core values w- were the same, and so I think it's important that you have to cling to values, but not be a bureaucrat around rules, because you 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 know things happen in the market, and all of a sudden you have to change. We had a really hardcore you come into the office and work rule. And now we're work from anywhere. Well, that that was that was traumatic for me uh, to make that change. That's a rule. It's not a value. We can still be self motivated and resourceful. We can still show respect to everyone. We can still do the right thing even when no one's looking. In fact, our values become more important during that rule change because we talk about that a lot. When the rules change, okay, when we say do the right thing even when no one's looking, now literally no one's looking. So you have to do the right thing every day, all day. We say show respect to everyone. Well, we always talked about our office neighbors. Now we're talking about the people that you are neighbors with in your house because you represent us when you're working at home. You know, we, we, we had to go through all of those and the values still applied, but our rules for engagement completely changed. And so I, th- I think that's the important thing for people is, as they look at innovation is that, you know, the, the, the rules are always, the, you know, it's just like the NFL or the NHL or NBA. They're always amending the rule book. But like the core values of not lying, cheating, or stealing, those those stay the same. I think Bill Bel- Belichick tr- was trying to change the rule book over the weekend, but uh, we <laughs> we went ahead there. With always, that. I mean, that's the way they are. You yeah. can't be a strict bureaucrat on the rules. You know, you okay. got you got to be willing to to just amend amend the rule process. Well, look, let's talk about another rule: partners. You mentioned you used yeah. the word "we." You have you, you you had partners. You have partners. Still have them. Still have them. Um, I talked to VCs, Laura and I've talked to them. They say, listen, when a startup comes in the door, boy, if we've got a one founder company versus co-founders, we'll bet with co-founders, all things being equal. Okay. So I've got this great idea, James. Should I try to seek out Laura as a business partner or should I be able to just recognize when it happens and adapt like you did uh, in Argentina? Yeah. So I'll say this. I love life with co-founders and I love life with partners. There is, there is very little better than someone who completely, totally has your back, who is a, who is a partner at the table with you making ownership level decisions. And we follow a process to talk about in the book called EOS, uh, written by Gina Wickman. And in there, you have this concept of the owner's box and then you have your leadership team. Because the, the the owners have to make a capital decision on where to commit capital. <laughs> I mean, that's the and how much risk they're willing to take. It's kind of what you do as an owner. It's like the, the main the main decisions you make as an owner versus an executive is where to deploy capital and how much risk do you want to take. Everything else is execution beyond that. And then you know a visionary CEO slash visionary has to actually decide what you're going to do. Like, what direction is the ship headed? <laughs> what industry are we working in? You know that that's that's a that's really a, a, a a, a lot of a lot of the CEO's job, and so I I'd say when it when it comes to partner selection, I, I say this that you have to pick it as as carefully as you choose a spouse, because your business partners will either make your life wonderful as mine have my my father and Sebastian, absolutely amazing partners, just re- really great, um, or they'll make your life a living hell, and and I could have filled this this book's 50,000 words. I could have done 49,000 words on horror stories of people's partners and co-founders because that's how many people have told me about nightmare horror stories because they're not aligned on values usually. Is usually the number one thing. They they have different core values or there's a battle for who's going to be the executive. And that's that's where things like EOS help you sort out who's the visionary CEO, who's the integrator COO. That's an extremely important relationship. I do a whole chapter on the integrator and how important that 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 you know right hand person is. But you also um, you have someone holding you accountable, and I think that's where people forget that 
that account that the power of accountability people humans who are not accountable to anybody are very dangerous because no one's willing them call, to call them into account one of the chief things that sebastian does for me is call me on the mat when i'm off the rails and if you don't have partners and everybody is an employee they don't do that they they won't just out of sheer self preservation they won't hold you accountable. And when you're a when you're an entrepreneur and you're a bootstrapper, you're the board too. Like I don't have a, I am the board. Sebastian and I are the board and the two top executives. There is nobody else. And we have no debt, so there's no bank requiring anything from us. We literally answer to our customers and ourselves, and that's it. And so when you're in that situation, if you're by yourself and you don't have a co-founder, that's a really lonely room to sit in. When you got someone just in the mud with you, because at the end of the day, a lot of like some of the worst days that are, that I've documented in this book, January fourteenth, oh eight, I could run through when nine eleven happened, when 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 January fourteenth of oh eight happened, when we lost all a bunch, a bunch of our servers, and all these difficult days. You know, my first calls were to the owner group, and then we, we you know, and the, the last people put in the put in the company to sleep at night was the owner group, and the pe- first people waking up. You know, that's that's really who who's who's uh who's there fighting in the mud and then you find your kind of your leadership team and hopefully they have that same commitment and dedication and we we did we got very lucky there so i think that's the importance of it is that you've got to really be super careful people are far too casual about who they give stock to and they're far too casual about who who they co-found with so i think you have i think they should be far far more careful like marriage careful and and secondly once you have i think it's it's a benefit to do that because that person will if it's the right pick will hold you accountable and be your partner and you know slog through it with you and and then like with me Sebastian and I were acquaintances we became best friends through the process my dad and I became even closer so if it works out correctly they'll be one of your best friends in the whole world do you have any tips for people wondering you know if you, you can't really date these individuals i mean you could but that's a whole other chapter but how how can you be marriage careful when identifying individuals to come work with you, especially in the early phases. Have you learned anything where there's a tell or you always gravitate towards X? That's really hard. <clears throat> that's like that's like saying, how do, you, how do you evaluate people, right? The only way to really evaluate any person is to work with them. That's it. I mean, you have to actually jump in because there are so many people. And I'm going to use an example here, salespeople. So many salespeople are absolutely amazing interviews. Like they know how to sell themselves better than anybody, anything else on the planet. You say, sell me this pen, they will sell you that pen in that interview. You know, like that they're amazing. And then they get into the job and you find out they like to wake up late. They like to go to bed early. <clears throat> they like to work six hour days, play golf twice a week and, they're much more interested in entertainment than like, I'm not saying all sales people are that I'm just saying that I'm using a fictitious example. And so how someone interviews and how someone speed dates, they can put up a front for a short period of time. <clears throat> I, I have seen a lot of success in, in working together on a joint venture, um, working together with a letter of understanding, you know, a letter of intent, Um, for a period of time in a trial period, I've definitely seen a lot of that. And I've done that because we've done joint ventures where we've co-developed and co-invested in product. And we did a trial dating process first before we signed that document, making us legal partners. We, we actually went through working with them on a daily basis to build something before we got fully, fully committed because of that exact thing, because a lot of people interview really well. And, and many of them that interview really well end up being not the best partner. And so this is difficult, whether you're picking a joint venture partner or you're picking a legal partner to start a new startup or that, that you do more than just, you know, a few lunches that, that that's, that's not, that's not enough. Ideally you would, you would ask around about them. You would have a network. You would ask their friends what they're like in private. You know, the, the best people that, to, to ask, you know, maybe, maybe some employees of theirs, how they treat them, clients, how they treat them. You know, it's uh, people have references, whether they'll give them to you or not. Well, maybe we just shift the conversation to insurance, insure tech, yeah. property and casualty, life insurance. So James, here's a question for, I'll start off. Is there, 
Is there still gold in them? Them are hills. <laughs> you know, we've seen Twitter layoffs in the news, Facebook, Facebook layoffs, Amazon, Amazon. But you know, that's just the actually, beginning. Yeah, we we actually already saw that in the insurance sector. Like I, I'm yeah. gonna say, what starting maybe 12 months ago. What's what's the future like for disruption here in this space? Yeah, there's still so much low hanging fruit <laughs> in insurance. I was on an interview the other day, and they said, well. The person I was talking to said, well, we figured out policy and claims. It's not about that anymore. It's really about this. You know, they're talking about telematics or predictive analytics or artificial intelligence. Okay. <laughs> and then I said, hey, I've got to stop you there because we have not figured out policy and claims. I'm still working with huge companies who are scrapping massive implementations of policy and claim systems because they failed to implement. All right. So... We have not figured out the basics. We have a ton of legacy software driving this industry, a lot of it. And there are some really big mainline solutions that continue to have failed implementations and continue to not allow people to move off of AS400, IBM, <laughs> IBM mainframe systems, or old school COBOL or old school Java on, on you know, that, that, there's, that's still going on. And it still makes it really hard to add lines and states. So how can we as an insurance business really get a lot better if our core administrative duties, which are a super important part of this business, right? Like is we don't actually make anything in insurance. We, we, we underwrite risk, right? So our product is documents. And if we can't issue those documents quickly and we can't add new lines and states, then the markets suffer. And I'm going to use one example. Two example, three example. No, I'll use one. Aviation. I'm a pilot, so I like using this. We're down to 10 markets. It's not good. It's not healthy for the aviation business. And you're going to see impacts from aviation premiums going through the roof because there's not enough competition. And the ones that are there, ones that are, there are not doing savvy things to, to measure and manage risk. Like they're not even using publicly available traffic data to find out how much you're flying and where you're going. Not even doing that. So there are some basic things they're not doing that are increasing their risk exposure. There are um, some, some big, bigger losses. They're driving premiums up. And of course, their investment income got, took a hit too. And now we're down to 10 markets and there's not enough competition. And when it's really difficult to add lines and states, other people might stay out of it because they're like, no, the administrative costs of spinning up that line of business are too high because our software takes a year to change anything. I mean, honestly, that is the conversation that goes on in so many companies. I know a bunch of insurance companies that are literally holding back on expansion in the lines and states because they know that it takes too long for to, to expand their software product that drives their business. And they don't want to underwrite it in Excel and Word, which you could do. All right. I know other insurance companies that said that they've got to write X amount of business on Word and Excel until they'll even think about changing their software, which I thought was an interesting way of approaching it. So, yeah. There's a ton of opportunity. There's a lot of meat left on the bone. There's a ton of low-hanging fruit to fix. It's going to be a, a more scarce funding environment to, to build companies to chase some of these ideas. I think the other problem is that the, and this is why I'm trying to tackle policy and claims, because there's a lot of work around the exterior, but not a lot of work on the, on the core systems, right? And that, that's, that's the that's where a lot of the hangup is in insurance. And so I'm, I'm excited to see more work on the core plumbing. It's not as sexy because you're not necessarily even talking about AI. You're literally talking about just making a claims and policy system service-based, so a service-oriented architecture and cloud native. Just doing that would liberate so many insurance companies and, and, and allow them to actually execute what they want to execute strategically because right now they can't. So I'm going to ask you a kind of a loaded question. Do you think that's a, a tech issue or is that a people mindset situation that's slowing us down? Oh, it's both. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's both. You know, fear of unknown, fear of changes. Um, look, every insurance company should have as one of their core values stability, <laughs> like all of them. And if watching the Florida market is not reminding everybody of this lesson right now, that stability has to be at the core of everybody's mind. It sh you should be just all right. Just watching personal lines property should be reminding you that we all have to focus on stability. So stability has to be a mindset, but 
um, ex- executives, corporate executives, have to be willing to invest in technology, and have to be willing to to also place technology at the decision making table. And that's where I see still some failure is placing CIOs and CTOs on the executive team making decisions and not reporting two or three levels down. That's really difficult. That's a, that's a really it's a difficult place to be for them. Okay, so James, congratulations. You're executive vice president of claims at a major commercial property company. <laughs> yep. Here in Har- here in Hartford. Oh. So yeah, so it's cold. So so you what lessons, you know, walk us through what do your first 90 days look like? How do you what lessons you take from your book and how would you apply them to the company? Well, I I wrote a chapter on corporate entrepreneurs because I thought that one one thing I wanted people to really take away from this is that you can have the bootstrap mindset inside of a large company. In fact, it'll help you accelerate a lot of your initiatives. And so I featured four people that I've met through the years in this chapter, just talking about how cor- corporate entrepreneurs can really dramatically overhaul a business. Um, and and they all have really, really, really good personal stories and gave a, a lot of really good tips for how to innovate inside of a large company, how to drive innovation, how to fund that innovation, uh, how to build teams. Uh, all of them listen well. All of them. And any of and, and what's interesting is I've known some of these folks for a very long time, and I've watched them take on those kind of roles, and I've watched them soften their approach over the years in their first 90 days a lot. And so... Uh, step number one is a really good listening tour and actually understanding what you're stepping in and managing. <clears throat> you know, if you step in and assume you already know everything about the business and you know where all their hidden problems are, then you're you're probably wrong. And so I think that um, that that's a, a big deal is learning how to ask questions. I, I talk about that a lot as one of my five steps to, to innovation in, in that chapter is, um, you know, if you have time to solve a problem, spend 55 minutes, if you have an hour to solve a problem. I didn't, this is not my quote. This is often misattributed to Albert Einstein, and it, it wasn't him that said it. So let's just attribute it to generic author because I, I couldn't find a source. But if you have an hour, spend 55 minutes studying the problem, five minutes studying the solution. And so you, you've really got to learn the problem. Like I actually did take over uh, my very first gig in insurance, one of my clients lost their CIO. They were an insurance uh, vendor. They lost their CIO and they asked me to step in as their interim. I think it was IT director at the time. So they lost their IT director. They asked me to step in as interim. So I actually got to do this. And the the first thing I did was like, just study the problem. Like literally, where is everything? Like physically, and then logically, where is it? And then What's the software that's driving this? And then what does that look like? And then I went and sat in cubicles and just watched people do their job, which you got to do some explaining because it can make people uncomfortable to have someone in a cubicle with you watching what you do. But it's it's the same thing I did when I built SmartBid. I went and sat in estimators' cubicles and watched them pre-qualify subs. And then I went and talked to the surety bond companies. And why do you want this data? What are you actually doing with it? Can you show me what you're doing with it? So I think that actually sitting and watching, one thing I am continually disappointed with is executives' willingness to actually get out of their office into a coworker's office and watch what's actually being used. Like physically watch them key a claim in. I I remember doing this because I had a this, this very first gig. I said, can you show me when an insurance inspection comes in and we have to go do it? Can you actually show me what you're doing? And they said, well, first I print out the inspection order and then I clip it right here. I actually... I bought a $5 clip and I put it here and I print it out. I went, Ooh, how much printing are you doing? Well, every single claim I get a, I'm like, Oh, okay. Why are you doing that? Well, because the fields don't line up and I have to rekey everything. So we, we immediately started making changes, right? Side by side views. Let's get rid of all the paper. I mean, that was, but that didn't happen until I went and sat in the cube. So look, if you gave me a, a claims organization, first thing I'm doing, I'm going to go sit down and watch them adjudicate claims like for a couple of weeks. I'm going to actually physically watch the job being done because you do not know what's going on unless you observe it with your own eyes. 
And then just start looking. I, I tell people this a, a, a lot. Look for paper in Excel. Where are they using paper in Excel? Because they're working around something. They're working around your system. If they're using paper in Excel or a Word document, they're working around some limitation that's going to slow them down. And then start asking them questions. And there's a, there, but there's a really big hesitance. Um, you know, there's an unfortunate attitude among some executives that they're too good for that or they're too busy for that or they've spent too much time on that. It's just like in my company, I log in and use my product. I am astounded at the number of technology executives and insurance who cannot physically cannot log you into their product and show it to you. They have to go get a sales engineer. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Like, well, like seriously, you don't even, you don't have authentication credentials to log into your own software and use it and you can't demo it to me? How are you even leading this company? I mean, seriously, they, 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 don't, they literally don't know what's going on in the product. And, and so it's one thing I challenge my people to do all the time. I'm like, if you don't have authentication, if you're not logging in, if you don't know how this works, we've got a big problem as a company. So you give me a claims organization, I'm going to log in. <laughs> I'm going to actually use the tools that they're using. I'm going to go sit in their cubicles and watch them adjudicate claims. Then I'm going to go meet with my ancillary service providers face-to-face, -face, not on Zoom, face-to-face. -face. And I'm going to go talk to them about what the issues are. You be my, I get about 10 times more info out of somebody face to face than I do on a phone call or Zoom meeting. About 10x. So I'm I'm going to travel around and go see him. If I've got fuel adjusters, I'm going to drive in the car with them. When I got elected to city council, Paul, the first time, 2012, first thing I did really freaked out everybody in the city. I went and rode along with my cops. Then I went and stayed a night at a fire station and rode along with the firefighters. Then I went to Public Works and uh, went around for all of their jobs, checking out roads, collecting garbage, doing all, all the stuff they did. Then I went to Parks and Rec and went and used the parks with them. Then I, I went to every stinking department and saw their job and hung out with them and rode in their car. And we went out and looked at stuff. And, and, and I had so many of them tell me, you are literally the first councilman I've ever had to do this for. Okay, that's sad. But it, it, it colored my entire two terms on city council. And, and most people don't want to do it. They don't want to get around and, and go. Well, they, they just want to step in and run their playbook. That's not that's not healthy. How do you even know what's happening? You know, like, you know, you have to use your data. You can't use like, oh, this this police officer said it's bad, so it must be bad. Not necessarily. So you have to you have to color everything, you know, a little grain of salt when you're doing those kind of those listening tours, because that's just one person's opinion. You do have to look at everybody's opinion. Same thing when I took out when I, when I became a regent two years ago at Texas Southern University, Governor, Governor Abbott appointed me. There was a huge crisis on the board. I came in. First thing I did is I, every other week I was on campus touring a different part of campus, looking at the buildings, talking to the departments. And, and seven out of 10 of them said they'd never had a regent come to their department before. Okay. And, and I immediately knew what I had to work on. So I, I, that's how that's how I would step in if you made me head of claims. I'm sorry for the long answer, but it's it, there's a lot of stories around that. Most people really mess that up. Love it, Laura. Yeah, no, it, it's it's true, James. I had a short stint where I worked at the power company, and we had quite the October snowstorm. So I had a chance to go be the power company representative in a small town with an atrocious amount of snow. And the first day you show up and you wear the logo and you tell the story and you shake the hands. And the third day you're burying the sweatshirt in the back of your car because God forbid you show up with that logo on and you receive the, the real feedback. But um, you know, I, f I find it interesting and I think it's a lost art of listening. And to your point, you're not going to know until you're riding in the car or sleeping in the fire station and, and doing these things. So I guess, you know, as we wrap our conversation today, um, what are what are the, the top one or two things that you want to share with the listeners about either your journey, it could be tips for, you know, active listening or why they need to go pick up your book? Well, I think bootstrapping principles are a pivotal part of innovation in any insurance company. I think the ability to take a little bit of cash and then to generate a profit and use more cash and to generate more profit and use more cash and to self-fund ideas inside of corporations could radically change the insurance business. 
They wouldn't feel like they have to go raise $10 million from a corporate investment committee, <clears throat> right? They could use their own budget. You can bootstrap in a company. I think bootstrapping principles are becoming a lost art because of the amount of capital that is at play um, and has been available. It's kind of spoiled everybody, and we're about to get a rude awakening. So I, I think that, and, and I thought it was so important that I wrote a book about it. <laughs> so uh, first is just study this concept of maybe not raising money and living within your means. Because, and I say this, and even though it's rule number four, it's <laughs> that I did that kind of ironically. The number one rule of business is to survive. You've got to survive. You've got to survive. You have to survive 9-11. You have to survive the economic downturn you, in, in 08, the Great Recession. You have to survive COVID. You have to survive all of these events. Uh, you have to survive to actually do anything of importance in an industry. And and so I think that's the, the, the main thing. And the main reason I'd like you to pick it up is just to, to start deploying these, these concepts about driving innovation and adapting technology and building economically sustainable businesses. What good is it if you have a great IPO, but your business can never generate a profit? Seriously, what was the point? It, you, you, if you can't build an economically sustainable business that can that can eat its own dog food and not require outside capital, you, ultimately it's a failure. It has to. It will end in failure if it never figures it out. You can't have a negative loss. You can't be negative on your loss ratios forever. <laughs> Eventually, the the piper comes, and he's coming right now. So I think that's the the main thing that that people have to to focus on, and why I think I'd like them to to pick it up and check it out because it, these are the things that my dad taught me. I had, I had the benefit of my father and a lot of other mentors teaching me the, the long hard way. And of course, two decades of, of life teaching me. And I, I'd, I'd like for people to not have to go through all the pain I had to go through to learn some of this so that they can, they can deal with uncertainty and scarcity of capital and all of the factors that are going to come into play in the next 24 months. And, and then, then, you know, thrive through it because there, you know, this is when opportunities created. This is when industries are changed. Is when there's downturns. Uh, this, this, James, this was great. Hey, I think it's cool we got you on the the first day of the the release. Uh, we'll put a link in the bottom uh, to your book to your website. Hey, listen, yep. th- thanks for coming and hanging out. Eventually, you're going to fly up here to Hartford, right? I, absolutely. I I did come to New York. Full disclosure, I I was in New York City, um, and. Uh, was not there on a weekday, so I didn't get to go up and hang out with you guys. I was there for this great conference called BravoCon because uh, my you, you guys would know the TV network Bravo. Yeah. yeah, my significant other really wanted to go to BravoCon, <laughs> so we came. We came, we came That's we great. Came, my wife and I came up there to New York for BravoCon, and I was like, "Man, Hartford's so close! I wish I could go." But we had a whole set of events there. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah. so I'm gonna I'm gonna come up, and we're, we're gonna have a dedicated trip to Hartford. I appreciate it. In the yeah, you know, my website's jamesbenham.com. The company is jbknowledge.com. So I uh, appreciate appreciate you having me back on, and thanks for what you're doing in the industry. I've I've enjoyed listening to your podcast since. Uh, since I was on last time, it's been a, a, a wealth of knowledge for me, and I appreciate all the time that you've been putting into it. Excellent. All right. Thanks. And thanks to our listeners. Join us again next week for another episode of the Reimagine Podcast. Thanks. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and recommend us on iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also get more great information about this company and other great startups at imagine.nfg.com.